Our presenter today is Dr. David Hibbs, who was one of the uh, uh, founders of the OSU Hardwood Silviculture Cooperative, of which the Washington Department of Natural Resources is a member. Um, and so what a I've founding, asked... A founding member. A founding member. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is, uh, is go ahead and, uh, David, if you want to go ahead and activate your uh, camera so we can see who you are. Um, so that's, that's David. And uh, because we do have some... Um, bandwidth uh, issues. I'll let you go ahead and do a little biography with your camera live and then uh, when you're through go ahead and uh, uh, cancel, the, cancel the webcam and jump into your presentation and I will go All ahead right. and uh, mute my mic. Well thank you. Uh, it's the first time I've ever done a webinar so we'll see how this goes. I suspect there'll be a few rough places. Please bear with me. Um, I'm Dave Hibbs and I'm quite happy to be here this afternoon talking with you. Um, I first came to Oregon State in the fall of 1983, and I was hired into an interesting contradictory position. It was an on-campus extension specialist, and I was supposed to help train people in how to manage the hardwoods, as well as educate people in how to do better vegetation management. So on a Monday, I might be talking about how to grow that wonderful red alder, and on Tuesday I be, might be talking about how to kill that dang red alder that keeps coming up in the Douglas fir plantations. A little schizophrenia at times. But it was actually a very good educational opportunity for me, um, and it's been a lot of fun through a lot of years. And uh, Let's see, all right, we'll try to click off the camera and start looking at some pictures here. Um, when I came and started trying to talk about uh, red alder and the other hardwoods in the region, it was very clear that there was close to nothing known about them. And so um, pretty quickly it became apparent that um, to do anything uh, really significantly educationally with red alder in particular, um, we needed to do some research on it. And that's where, all right, come on. There we go. So um, a little bit of background. In, it was 1985 when I really started thinking seriously about forming the Hardwood Co-op or, or some kind of research program. And Oregon State had a long history of research cooperatives. For those of you who are unfamiliar with them, it's really an association between a, a university and academic research unit and anybody out there in the public and private sectors who is interested in that particular question problem. And collectively, we work out some, some resolutions. In this case, red alder was the, the focus in how to um, manage that as a, as a commercial timber crop. Now, in 1985, there was lots and lots of natural red alder around, and that is largely because of the, the, the logging history of the past 50 years of, of clear-cut logging, little effort on, on regeneration. Logging was often ground-based, and so the seedbed that alder needs was uh, made in abundance, and we wound up with lots of alder covering hillsides. Uh, in 1985, the mill capacity was, was beginning to grow for red alder processing. Prices were beginning to increase, and so instead of being considered a problem, people were actually starting to haul it to the mills. Um, the, the increasing harvest rate did lead to some concerns, which still exist today, about a declining inventory. If we're harvesting a natural resource out there that we're not regenerating, then in the long run it's, it is going to decline as a resource. It was very clear that there was little understanding at that time of alder management. There had been a few studies, some, some um, stocking guide, not a stocking guide, uh, some yield tables for natural stands. But really there was very little in the way of management tools and certainly no information on managed stands. So a lot of conversations with a lot of different groups around the region. The challenge is to find people at that time who cared about alder enough to come together and try to sort out um, what we might do to improve our understanding of how to manage it. 
We held a meeting of those interested parties um, in 1988 and, and put together the co-op. That was the date of formation. And we wound up with members in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. So a, a pretty darn large geographic range, a range that does um, include most of the productive range of red alder. Now, contrary to a lot of research co-ops, we set out one primary long-term goal for this co-op. And that was to develop the data set that you need to model the growth and yield of managed red alder. Um, what do I want to say? I think I'll just keep going there. So what I'm talking about today is really how we got from 1988 to where we are today. And we do have a growth model. I guess that's the, the punchline at the end, right? Um, one of the first places that we had to start with was what kind of data does one really need to do modeling? Um, we're not going to teach you how to model today, so don't panic if that's not something that gets you excited. Um, but what you do need to have are repeated measurements made on planted trees. Uh, you need to have these trees planted over a range of site quality. You need to have these trees planted at a variety of densities. You need to have these trees thinned at different times to different levels. Um, and when you're all done, you'd kind of hope that some of the densities that you worked with were near the correct densities, because you'd like to be able to take people out there and show them how this works. Very quickly, as we looked at this, this list that you're looking at there, we, we realized that um, we were opening a lot of cans of worms. And, and I will look at those cans of worms in a minute. A little bit of background, though, on the co-op before we go there. Um, we've done a couple of other things that are primarily focused on this modeling goal, but I think are, are important to know about. One, we initially said, well, yes, we want to get some plantations going, but we know that it's going to take us a little while to do that. Can't we find some young natural stands and do some thinning in them and be kind of get a jump on the data. So we said, all right, we need a minimum of about 10 acres in a stand, less than 10 years old, that we can go out and do some thinning in. And we looked in southern BC, western Washington, western Oregon, in the late 80s to early 90s. And we found, as you, if you look at the map here, four, just four stands 10 acres in size, less than that, less than 10 years old. Now, maybe there were a couple out there we missed, but it was an eye-opener to me saying, my goodness, we are not creating much new alder anymore, that really this is, the, this is a measure of the success of vegetation management um, of, of Douglas fir plantation reestablishment, and it's a, a real credit to that. But it did mean that we couldn't find much in the way of alder stands natural alder stands to do thinning work in. But we have done, done four of these stands, and they're now close to 25 to 30 years post-thinning, and we are getting some interesting results out of them. Uh, a little off track, um, in some ways here, we realized later in the game that um, one of the questions that a lot of landowners deal with is, I've got some alder in my Douglas fir plantation. What do I do with it? When do I? When is it a resource? When is it a problem? How do I sort that out? And so we have started a study which is trying to provide some of the data that could look at that. We have seven sites where we put in what, uh, in research jargon, is a replacement series. We have a fixed spacing here, um, and we run from 100% dug fir through some proportions of alder all the way up to 100% red alder at, at each of our seven sites. So that those, those, the type 1s and the type 3s, you like our novel naming system here, type 1s and type 3s. Those are ongoing, but that's not where I want to focus now. The type 2s are the primary database for the modeling effort. Uh, these are alder plantations. These are large, each one of them, and there are 26 of these that run from uh, up here on Vancouver Island, up, well, all the way up here, all the way down to the Coos Bay area on the Oregon coast. At each site, we have planted a large area to alder. It has within it some 
blocks of, of, a, of a common density. I'm just far enough away from this screen. It's a little hard to see. Um, you can see here, there's a, 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 these are all of the same density. Um, and then we divide it up into some treatments, uh, which are later thinning treatments. So there will be a control plot within a density. Um, you'll see first, second, and third thinnings um, marked on some of these. That's a developmental stage. First thinning, for example, is when uh, the crown is just going to start lifting. Second is when the base of the live crown is 12 to 15 feet off the ground and, and, and so on. We also, for, um, no, I'm going to back up. Our, our planting densities, our target planting densities here were 100 trees per acre, 230 trees per acre, 525 trees per acre, and 1,200 trees per acre. Now, we know that nobody in their right mind is going to plant 100 trees per acre or 1,200 trees per acre, but this is the data set for modeling. So we very much wanted to make sure we spanned very widely the range so that when you develop your regression equations, you have them well anchored in the center part of it, which is where you're going to do your management. Um, the wider, the, the, one, of, one of these 230 treatments, you can see here it actually doesn't say 230, it's 275. We target 230, but we always plan a little dense, particularly in those early days, because we weren't sure of what level of success we were going to have. Um, we actually were more successful most of the time than, than uh, we expected. So the densities vary a little bit, but we have these four basic density targets and are close to those. But you can see in this wider spaced initial one, there's also a pruning treatment. Um, these installations have uh, permanent plots within them. They get measured every three years early on, every five years now. Um, we're now doing the 22nd year measurement in these installations. Some of them have already passed that point. So can you imagine alder plantations, 22 years old? They're, they actually are rather pretty things. Yeah, I guess you have to like alder. But. Now, okay, cans of worms. When you start talking about establishing a plantation of a, of a new species, you realize that there's a whole lot of things you don't know, like um, how do you collect seed? Where do you collect seed? Um, you know, for Douglas fir, this has been worked out very well. People just go out and do it. If you're a regeneration forester, you count on other people to know how to do it, have done it right, and you just buy your, your seedlings from a nursery. We had to sort this all out from the beginning. There had been a couple of genetic studies which allowed us to um, get together a meeting of geneticists and some silviculturists and sit down and say, okay, how do we synthesize this genetic information um, and come up with some seed zone maps? And, and we put that together. It was very interesting dealing with seed collection. Um, it turns out that the seed cones on, on red alder are glued together. They don't open easily in a dryer until after they have been rained on a bit. It needs to dissolve a, a sticky coating on them. So some of our early collections were a bit early, and we couldn't get the seed out of them. So anyway, um, you know, seed collection is one small part of establishing a plantation, and yet there were a number of issues that we had to resolve. Seedling production. Well, first you've got to know how to stratify your seed. Uh, that took a little bit of work. I, I should point out that the work on really on seedlings was done by uh, Washington DNR out of Centralia and the Weyerhaeuser folks. They did a lot of work and have been very generous in sharing that information uh, quite widely. Um, nursery practices. Uh, quite a number of surprises there. The first nursery beds that we put in, or were put in, I guess I should say, um, we planted it uh, at a, a normal Douglas fir kind of density. Um, a 1-0 alder seedling is plenty big. They can be, uh, you know, two to six feet high, depending on, on how well you've watered and fertilized them. Um, so we're talking about 1-0 seedlings here. Um, but working with a Douglas fir seedbed density resulted in seedlings that when we outplanted them got sun scald. We realized that we needed a lower bed density. Um, we also 
uh, knew that alder is a nitrogen fixer, that, that the nodules of alder seedlings that you find in the wild have nodules on them um, for fixing that nitrogen. Most uh, nursery beds traditionally are, are sterilized between crops, and so the Frankia, that's the bacteria that does the work in the nodule, um, is, is not present in those beds. What we found very quickly was that in outplanting seedlings from nurseries where no Frankia was present in the bed, so no nodules were present on the roots, the seedlings just sat the first year. It, we realized it was very important to grow seedlings um, that were inoculated in the nursery so that when we planted them out, they didn't have to sit there for a year at becoming nodulated and then growing fine. Uh, we learned uh, about some disease problems, particularly late season disease problems in the nursery beds. Uh, seedling storage, of course, uh, pretty much done the same way Douglas fir is, nothing too tricky there. Okay, where do we plant alder? Well, from a research standpoint, what we want to make sure we do is that we have our research sites covering the range of conditions that people are likely to be asking questions about. It's a little like that density range of 100 to 1,200 trees per acre. We want to be sure that we're covering uh, the geographic range here. So we divided the Pacific Northwest up into some physical zones. And then within those zones, we said we want to make sure that we have installations ranging from sites that are quite low alder quality through medium and to high quality, so that when we're all done, our data set can really model all of these conditions. So, and what you see here is our filling of this matrix. These are all our sites um, and the cells within this matrix in which they fall. We didn't find any South Cascade high site locations, for what it's worth. I guess they don't exist. Um, so where do we plant? What we have learned is that um, in a broad sense, better Douglas fir sites are better alder sites. That, of course, can be a bit of a conflict in land use for some landowners. Um, the better sites tend to be, as you can see in this picture here, middle and, and lower slope settings. These upper slopes and ridges tend to be um, dry from alder's point of view. Douglas fir doesn't show the same sensitivity to soil moisture that alder does. Um, coming down the slope, you can get into some frost pockets down here in the bottom that we found alder also rather sensitive to. And contrary to some popular belief, alder doesn't like its, its feet wet. This particular site that you're looking at here is down inland of Coos Bay, so it's the central southern Oregon coast. Uh, it's a north-facing slope. And so we're getting towards the southern end of the alder range, but on this north slope, a lower slope, lower slope position here, this is one of our better alder sites. So it, it is an indication that there are good alder sites throughout the alder range that, that people can be looking for. Connie Harrington of the PNW station in Olympia has produced a very nice tool for predicting site index for red alder based on some physical uh, and climatical uh, climatological characteristics, um, some topographic features, some soil features, and some of these uh, droughty features too, a drought and frost pocket issues. And with her tool, you can predict some site index. Many of the places we're looking to plant alder don't have alder currently on them, and so um, Douglas fir site index isn't always a good predictor of alder site index, so this tool has been very helpful. Um, she did her work in southwest Washington, um, but we have used it in Oregon and north of, of southwest Washington, um, and it's been a useful tool throughout that, that range. Washington DNR uh, has used this tool to look at their lands in southern southwestern Washington to stratify the landscape into um, better and poorer alder site quality. So as they have been making decisions on where to put alder, they've been able to focus um, on those better sites. And they've looked at their whole landscape this way. It's 
a really neat application. Okay, so now you know where to plant, right? Why do we plant? Certainly when we got involved with uh, the hardwood co-op, one of the questions was, should we be trying to plant alder or should we be just working with natural regen or spreading seed? Um, and so we did do a little bit of playing around with um, putting seed out, um, trying to see what came of that process. It was very clear pretty quickly that trying to grow uh, up, uh, what, an alder stand from seed out in, in, on a hillside was a very a hap or not haphazard, but hazardous and, and uh, unpredictable event. Sometimes we had very little germination of that seed. Sometimes it was excessively dense. It was very unpredictable. The spacing control was very poor. Um, uh, we used lots of seed doing it, and seed wasn't all that easy to collect. So um, very quickly, we moved to planting as opposed to seeding areas to give us the control um, of spacing, of, of quality um, that we wanted, of predictability. Site prep. The site prep that you're looking for is really very comparable to what you would consider adequate for Douglas fir. Um, you certainly want to remember, though, that you want to do that site prep. You need to anticipate the problems and, and do a good job of it because coming in later and doing release generally isn't an option. None of the chemical options for release are, are on the table. So when do we, when do we plant? Um, it's a later planting window than um, for Douglas fir, which means that your planting crews are available when it's alder planting season. When we initially did some planting during this, you know, the January to February planting window of Douglas fir, what we found was that it didn't really matter quite when we planted the Douglas fir out. Within a couple of weeks, it was breaking bud. And if we then had frosts after that, we were getting damage. So we have looked now at um, uh, more of a March into early April window. Kind of depends on where you are north-south in the range. But it's, you're, you're, you're looking at your weather patterns and trying to get after the danger of serious cold frosts is past. Some fall planting is possible, but that's a matter of getting your seedlings dormant enough that you can actually lift them and, and, and plant them in the fall. With Douglas fir, we've all been taught that you want to be careful about planting them at a depth very similar to what they were in the nursery. Uh, with alder, it's not the same kind of sensitivity. They actually can grow some roots out of that stem if you plant them a little deep, um, a little deeper than they were in the nursery. So it's not something to worry too much about, and there may, may be some benefits, that's an educated guess there, to planting them a little deep. Uh, the densities. Um, now, this is a qualitative kind of summary for you right now because we don't have plantations that have made it to harvest age. Um, so we can play a little bit with growth models and we can look at how our plantations are developing and how our thinning activities have gone. But we're looking probably at dens planting densities of five to 600 trees per acre. So here we have one of uh, a number of successful plantations. I think this one is in southwest Washington. Not sure if it's a DNR or a warehouser plantation. But density management, this is where we get to have fun. Um, Regulating planting density, of course, is, is very important because it's going to regulate not only the form of your trees, but the growth rates of your trees. We need to be considering whether we're doing pre-commercial pre thinning, and if we are, there's both how much and when do you do it. Um, and then there's even, uh, to our surprise, um, lately we have been thinking about whether commercial thinning is something to put on the plate. So. Planting density. 
you're looking here at a couple of our planting areas. The one on the left um, is a fairly high density. It looks more like the, the five to six hundred trees per acre range, where the one on the on the right is um, perhaps the 100 trees per acre range. And you can see the form difference. The one on the right has actually got multiple stems there. Um, you can see them coming up through here. And that's something that we have seen a fair bit. Sometimes this, this form it can also be blamed on some poor nursery practices. We have found, it, particularly in the early days as we were learning better nursery practices, that um, those high bed densities um, uh, led to seedlings that would behave this way as well. It was because sometimes it was the sun scald, sometimes it was the, the weak apical dominance of these seedlings, um, but the, the wider bed densities helped deal with this quite a bit. But very wide spacings, you're still going to see these more bush-like alders coming up. Okay, this graph comes from one single study site of the 26 that we have. Um, across the bottom, you're looking at the, simply the age of the plantation, and on the, on the left here, we've got the, the, the diameter at breast height on these trees, and you can see the four initial planting densities of these, um, these uh, trees. Uh, so these are the, density, the actual planting densities, not the target planting densities, and you can see that for all of the trees in these measurement plots, if you look at the, all of the trees, that the largest diameters are where the density is the lowest. Shouldn't be a big surprise. And the smallest diameters down here, the yellow line, are where the densities are the highest. Now, this is all of the trees in, in these installations. The next graph are what we're calling crop trees. These are the, the 100 largest trees. So these may be the ones that you're going to be carrying longer. Um, if you're going to be doing some thinning, these are the ones that you're going to be favoring. And these curves have changed. No longer, at least early on, is the black line the lowest density on top. Rather, our intermediate densities um, are doing best early on. If you don't thin them, you can see uh, these lines are crossing each other and um, we wind up with a, a relationship that's more familiar to us, wider spacings give us larger trees. Um, okay, here's height for the crop trees again. This is the 100 largest trees. And notice that the widest spacings here are the shorter trees early on in, in this. That there is, and this has been seen in all, very frequently with alder and to some extent in Douglas fir as well. Um, higher densities are giving us um, better height growth. Now that effect declines with the increasing size of these trees, um, but early on um, some of these higher densities are giving us better height growth. Turning that height and diameter into volume, so this is the, the volume in cubic feet here. Um, at the four planting densities from very wide to the, the, the 1,200 trees per acre. Um, and uh, the black down here are the 12 inch plus DBH trees. So you can see that the, the highest volume is, is present in the inter intermediate densities, but the largest number of large diameter trees, maybe poor formed branchy suckers, uh, but largest diameters are here in our lowest density. Um, okay, let's take a look at some, okay, planting density summary. Okay, young alder um, it has some vulnerabilities. Frost in particular are things that we have, have seen. Um, a couple of times folks have done poor weed control up front and coming in and trying to do some sort of release has been, been very expensive for them, basically a manual treatment. Uh, so your, your real target here is getting that alder to grow quickly, to occupy that site early on. And this is a combination of your site prep, of good seedling quality, 
of good seedling care between the nursery and outplanting. Um, you got to get that whole package together. Young alder does do better with um, at, at least moderate densities, if not high densities. You get better stem form out of it, which is both branch size and straightness. Um, better natural pruning, which in the long run is going to increase lumber grade recovery in them. And surprisingly, um, some of these higher densities are also giving us some better growth rates. So coming back to planting densities, here's the five to 600 trees per acre as kind of our best guess at this point on, on a compromise between some of the trade-offs between growth quality and site occupancy early on. Um, some growth figures for you, and this is looking at sort of mean growth between age three and age 17 in, in our, our plantations. Uh, we see an, a, a DBH mean annual increment of about a half an inch a year. Uh, height, mean annual increment of over three feet a year, and uh, a volume increment, cubic volume increment of, of about 85 cubic feet. Now, these are from our research installations. They're, you know, they are where we put them. Um, some are good sites, some bad sites. Some did better than others. Um, you're going to fall probably somewhere in that range, but um, you may do better, you may do poorer. Um, I think one of the things you can see in the graphs that I showed is that these young stands do develop very fast uh, and that relationships among the different densities were beginning to shift by the, well before these trees were 10 years old. So this is where we start thinking about intervention, meaning thinning. Um, it really is going to have to happen pretty fast um, and that's where we're going to go next. Pre-commercial thinning, and questions here are both about the, the intensity, what density are you cutting to, and the timing of that event. I've done some of this pre-commercial thinning. Um, I like it, I've also done PCT work in, in Douglas Fir, and I like the alder a whole lot better. By the time you're out doing this, um, most of the time you can see how clean these bowls are. Um, they've got enough height to them that they, they fall really quite easily. Um, they're not so heavy that you can't just put your shoulder against them and make them go where you want them. It's, it's a very, very nice process. Okay, density. We do have this stock and guide. Klaus Putman put this together a long time ago as part of his PhD work here. Um, and so you do have this density guide, and, and I encourage you to use this. It's really the only tool we have for making decisions um, on where you're going to be managing, how to keep your stand within um, uh, some reasonable management zones. As you do your PCT work, you want to keep your spacing uniform. Uh, this is even more important for alder than it is for Douglas fir. Alder if, if the light resource up there that it's growing towards is irregularly spaced, it will grow towards that light and you'll get more curvy stems. And you look at about these trunks in these very evenly spaced plantations, particularly the one on the right, very straight. Um, you can keep them that way if you keep the light evenly distributed. Um, and that really means avoid uh, uh, unevenness and also um, not opening it up too much at one time. Um, been a few very rare occasions, very rare occasions where opening it up too much led to some breakage. I think it was some unusual ice storms. Been a rather rare event. We find it more on the edges of stands than within these stands, but we have seen it. So some data. This is data that comes from thinning um, in the, the, the 600 tree uh, treatment um, at this one site. And you can see here the black line is the control line where the, the diameter grows and grows and grows, but um, it is dropping behind these two, uh, the red and the, and the green line. Um, the red line was thinned at age five. The, green line was thinned at age 8 to 235 trees per acre. If 
you recall, that's our other planting target density. Um, you can see that, you know, at age six here, when we measured these trees, the density, uh, you know, they were performing about the same. But the thinning that happened between age, well, I guess this, the, the red line got thin just before that, didn't it? Um, put it, started it on this higher trajectory here. The green line really is performing essentially the same as the red line. It, it was a little bit behind it. That just may be a small site variation at that location. Um, so not a whole lot of difference in these lines in the 5 and 8 thinning. But clearly thinning made a big difference in the long run by age 17. You're, you've got 2 inch more diameter here in the thin stands than you do in the control. Okay, this is all trees. Here's all tree height. Um, and again, thinning wound up producing better height growth. Again, that's a little bit of a surprise to most of you who've been through our traditional uh, forestry education. We think of height growth as not being very sensitive to spacing. Um, but we're certainly seeing this kind of effect fit very predictably in our red alder that if we can maintain the optimal spacing, we can maximize our height growth in these stands the same way we do with our diameter growth. Here's how this plays out for volume. The, the left bar here is our control. Middle bar is the thinned at age 5, and the, the right bar is the thinned at age 8. And um, it's, it's amazing that thinning at five ver age 5 versus thinning at age 8 does make a difference in how this comes out. You've already got a lot more volume out here in thinning just three years earlier. So, PCT summary. Um, now I look at my clock, I'm getting worried, folks. Reduce the, your density for, if, if you're just doing a, a PCT aiming at a, a, a harvest cut next, a clear cut, 200 to 225 trees per acre. Um, if you're thinking about a commercial thinning, we can make some guesses about that and I'll, I'll come back to it. Use your stocking guide to make some decisions about how to, what densities you really want for your site, for your economic conditions. Keep your spacing uniform. Don't open it up too much uh, all in one step. Do remember, we're seeing a difference between the response thinning at age 5 and age 8. So you really need to be looking at your alder stands early. I, I tell people if it's, you know, if it's a stand is older than age 10 or 15, it's probably not worth the cost. Maybe even older than age 10, it's not worth the cost to go out there and thin them. Um, people in Douglas fir world have looked at uh, live crown ratio here, height to the base of the live crown. Um, 40 to 50 percent as, as a reasonable time to do thinning. We found in red alder that that is much too late. Um, so an average site when you're getting in there to do your thinning at age 5 to 8, your trees could, are going to be 4 to 5 inches in diameter, 25 to 35 feet tall. Base of the live crown is up a little bit, but not too far. Um, and this recommendation is really trying to balance a number of variables here um, and clearly represents a compromise between these various factors. Here's a vigor, response potential, growth rates, yield, some, some piece sizes down the road. And so, you know, you may want to do something a little different, but this is at least a starting point for you for making some, some decisions. All right, commercial thinning. We have thought about commercial thinning. There is no data on commercial thinning. Um, one of, I think one of the reasons that we early on ruled out commercial thinning as a, as a, as a question to even ask was that we all knew that alder wood rotted really quick. Any, anybody who's been in a wood, an alder stand and you find alder logs on the ground, they, they turn the moisture pretty quick. And we assumed that damage from a thinning operation, particularly a commercial thinning operation, would be really hard on the residual trees. Um, some work in BC and some work uh, in PNW Station on disease on the um, 
containment of wounds um, in alder shows that it does an incredibly good job of containing damage and that it doesn't spread and that in living trees then um, the concern about damage is no different than you would have in any other tree. You don't like it, you don't want it, you minimize it, but it's not a disaster that one might imagine. So there is an opportunity to consider um, commercial thinning um, and it's just something that needs some brainstorming um, and some research. Probably some, some mill recovery studies to see what would come out of it and what the value of that wood is. Management tools. I think I'm going to move along here. Um, we, you know, coming into the start of the hardwood co-op, we didn't have a whole lot of tools to work with. David. Pardon me? Can you hear me, Ralph? Ralph, you can't hear me? Ralph? Uh-oh. Have I really lost you? Now what do we do? Okay. Well, what's the problem, Ralph? Okay. I lost your sound, uh, but it's... Are, are we back? Uh, apparently, you're... Other people heard you. I didn't. So. Oh, okay. Okay, but uh, okay, I'm hearing you now. Right. Okay, we'll keep going then. Um, so we, we we certainly started. You know, when we started the co-op, we had some old tools, largely from natural stands, to work with. And over time, we've been developing some newer tools as we put together these plantations and learned a lot from that experience. Um, all right. Uh, I've talked about some of the seed collection tools, the site selection tools. Um, Connie Harrington and Bob Curtis uh, put together some new site index curves for red alder. Um, so we now have those. Um, we work with a base age in these new curves of 20 years because um, alder grows so darn fast. Um, Here's, here's what they look like. Uh, we're comparing some of the old Schumacher's old curves to um, Harrington and Curtis's new curves. Um, the stocking guide that we talked about. So as you're making thinning decisions, you do have this to, to guide you. Um, to build a growth and yield model, we needed some taper equations for alder trees from managed stands. There were existing taper equations, and on here that's the Johnson and, and the Curtis here, some taper equations from uh, natural stands. We did some work in our plantations and developed new taper equations based with four inch top and five inch top rules. And so this is just showing you um, how some of these compare for trees in, in, in different densities. So, there's a PNW publication out on these taper equations, a GTR for people looking for that, and then they have been incorporated into the growth model we'll get to eventually. Um, growth models. In British Columbia, we have the, the TAS TIPSI combination, and um, that's a, 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 a well-developed model. It's not an empirical growth model like most of ours are. They base this more on, on some form, crown form predictions of growth from that. Um, we have um, down here in the states that both the FVS, the Forest Service System, and FPS both of those modeling systems are based on um, a relatively small sample of trees and, as far as I know, only from natural stands. Um, and the old versions of Organon are also have an alder unit in them, but those are also from um, natural stands. Um, TAS is able to deal with, with management because of the different structure to the, to the model. Um, and finally, Organon. And this is this is really represents for us the the goal of of the hardwood co-op was the developing of a growth and yield model. And so a few years ago, we put together all of the co-op data with all of the um, 
plantation plot data from Weyerhaeuser, and they had a similar number of sites. We had our 26, and they had just about the same number, I believe. All of theirs were from that southwest Washington area. And we developed a version of Organon called RAP, R-A-P, Organon, um, that does model um, alder plantations. And the, the plantation data that went into it was age, basically age 0 through age 17, because at the time we were doing this, that's what we had. Um, and so we have been doing a lot of exploration of that model. Um, you can find that model. You can access that model through either the Hardwood Co-op web page or the SIPS, which is the Center for Intensive Plantation Silviculture web page. Um, these are both cooperatives within the College of Forestry at Oregon State. So if you go to the, Oregon, the, the College of Forestry website, Click on research. Click on click on research cooperatives, and then scroll down to Hardwood Co-op or SIPS. You can find access to RAP Organon. Um, we have had a lot of fun exploring how well this model works, um, and it does an amazingly good job. It it clearly is not perfect um, because the oldest trees in it, except for what we use for some of the mortality functions, um, we're, but for the growth, growth work, it's only 17-year-old plantations. Extrapolating this a whole, you know, beyond about 30 years is, is pushing my comfort limit. I, I recommend that people be really cautious in doing that. As we have recently been measuring a, much, a, a lot of our older plantations, now we've got a lot of 22-year data. And one, this is pushing us to do a revision of RAP Organon. It's, it's time to do that um, because we've got a lot better data set at 22 years. is a lot closer to the 30 to 35 year that we suspect rotation age will be. Um, and as, as we have, what we, we've played a game, as, as modelers like to do, we have taken our plot data at age three, and we have both projected that plot data with RAP Organon to age 22, and then we have looked at our data that where we measured it, what we collected at age 22. And um, we're finding that a lot of the time the model is under-predicting growth and yield by, you know, 10% or so. Um, I'm glad it's not over-predicting. That would worry me because people would be thinking they're getting more than they probably are. Um, so we will, we will be continuing to work to improve this model in the next year or two. I'm sure we will start a revision process um, of, of RAP Organon. So a little bit of a summary here. Uh, the co-op is certainly continuing on. Uh, we have our treatments at age 22 are going forward. We will measure them every five years as long as the landowners are going to let us go out there and keep doing it. Um, we will continue our research and out, research, our efforts in, in outreach and general education. That's been an important part of what we do. There continue to be questions about uh, the, the supply out there on the landscape and whether plantations can bridge that gap. We're having a lot of fun, and we'll continue to test these models and explore how well they work and, and you know, what are they telling us about rotation ages and economic potentials. It's really pretty neat what you can see, so I do encourage you to go play with RAP Organon. Um, we have ongoing questions about the, about the effect of thinning on, on stem form, on pruning on stem form, and some of our preliminary look at the data, because we do have data on this, is that the effects on stem form of pruning are basically nil. Um, on, on the effects of thinning on stem form are a little less clear to me. We want to continue working on new and improving management guides to help landowners make decisions. Um, you know, for example, the, the mixed alder fir situation, where you get some alder in your plantation. How do you think about that? 
it would be really good to do some alder lumber recovery work from uh, some plantations. We think we've got better lumber quality in there, and if that's the case, then those trees should be worth more than natural alder. But we need that work. Some work, Weyerhaeuser's done a little work on, on genetics, but I think that work is not something that's going to be broadly available, so there's a real opportunity for more work in, in the public domain on, on alder genetics and seedling improvement. And finally, um, I have stepped down now as the director of the co-op. Glenn Ahrens uh, is the director of the co-op. Andy Bloom has been a longtime uh, research assistant and, and assistant director of the co-op. Um, Glenn Ahrens did cut his, his teeth in the co-op. He, he was the research assistant who established a lot of the plantation, so he's very familiar with alder very interested in it. So the future of the co-op is in good hands. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what these guys do with it. I think there's huge potential there. So with that, I, I thank you for your attention. And Ralph, I'll turn this over to you to collect some questions. And I, I guess I'll put the camera back on. Is that right? Yep. That be yep. what we're, we're going to try and do. Um, we have the ability, uh, if you have a question that you wish to ask and you have a microphone on your computer, um, I can give you microphone privilege and you can go ahead and ask Dave directly. Um, let me get this set up so that I can see who has a question. So what you can do is you can uh, either do that or raise your hand and I can do it that way too. Or you can post your question in the question <coughs> panel. Let me get my operation organized here. Are we committing that deadly sin of dead air? <laughs> this is like asking the student in class, you know, and, and yeah, the, yeah. the deer in the headlights look, yeah. Well, it, 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 just as you're getting things together, Ralph. Okay, we, 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 do have, we do have some questions coming in. Okay. Um, so Patrick, uh, who's one of our PC region foresters, says, uh, what have you seen with regard to slope percent and red alder production? We have worked with alder plantations and thinning in natural stands on some very steep slopes. Um, I think our sense is that maybe we get a little better production, um, but you also want to be cautious about slope stability. I mean, if you're, and I'm just thinking about it, if your soils are moving, um, you're not going to get straight trees out of it anyway. Okay. We certainly haven't seen it be a production problem. Okay, we have a question about uh, if the thinning is late, say age eight, um, does that improve self-pruning? Uh, your, your base of the live crown is is certainly higher, um, so you you will have um, uh, more what dead stems, dead branches going further up the stem. One of the pieces of advice we've always given people doing PCT work is to thin, to drop the trees in such a way that they're falling, not directly on, but you, it'd be nice to use them to some extent to clean dead branches off of leaf trees. Um, behind the question, though, is an assumption that you're going to get paid more for um, cleaner trees, um, better lumber recovery, and that uh, really comes into, to my mind, very similar to questions about is it worth pruning dug fir, and everybody says, well, we ought to get more money for that, but so far no mill that I know of is paying more money for pruning trees, so um, I think that's an open question. 
I don't know how that will work out. More questions, Ralph? We lose you in some way? So here's the question. Okay. Um, the, the question has to do with, uh, even though there isn't a lot of research on commercial thinning targets, do you have any recommendations anyway? Uh, I think my recommendations probably come out of my experience thinning my own woodland, my own woods in, in Douglas fir, so I don't think my conclusions are going to be very different from ones that the rest of you who, who think about these questions uh, would come to. Um, and that is that if you're thinking of doing commercial thinning, um, you're either going to plant at a little wider spacing, which has some risks in it, so that you can put off that first thinning long enough to make it a commercial thinning. Um, and that worries me a bit. The alternative is to do a PCT that instead of going to 2 or 225 takes you to, I don't know what, 300 or something, 350, um, and um, let it go for another 10 years before you um, come in and do your commercial thinning. And then instead of having a 30-year rotation, you're going to have a, a 35 or 40-year rotation for the, the, the final harvest. This is where I think um, playing with Organon, particularly after we up, updated in a year or two, um, will really be helpful. Right now, you and I are, are making educated guesses, and we're all smart people, but it's important to recognize that, that they are educated guesses. Okay, we have uh, another question here. What's the um, average cost of a plantation establishment, or if, if nothing else, uh, relative to a Douglas fir plantation on the same site? So the seed, in other words, are the seedling costs about the same plant, planting costs? I'm, I think that they are about the same, but um, I'm the researcher in the crowd, and it's our cooperators who do the, who buy the seedlings, do the plantings, and, and so on. Um, DNR has done a lot of plantation establishment uh, work, both for the co-op and on their own. I'm guessing there's somebody in the audience who actually has direct experience with this for DNR anyway, who could be a lot more educated in a response. So, so if one of our DNR foresters wants to raise their hand uh, and chime in on this uh, cost of establishment. Scott, are you there? No, Scott is not with us. Um, oh. <laughs> he usually watches these on the recording. Um, so Julie uh, has a note in here that says um, Webster prices, Webster Nursery for 2 Douglas fir is about $1.08 a tree. Um, reduces uh, once over 100 trees, uh, and then plugs are 211. Plug one is about $1.89, and red alder is $1.42. So it looks like the ceiling costs are in the same same um, same ballpark. I, I imagine that price. I mean, these are 10 bare roots, probably, um, but you've got a lower bed density for them, so your cost is going to be a little higher. Okay. Um, so I keep th this. We have the questions are coming in, uh, coming in pretty strong here. Dave. Okay. Uh, so we have a question that says, I see a lot of natural red alder stands, and if I understood you correctly, if these are older than 15 years, the opportunity for thinning uh, to affect growth is really lost? It is. And, and the logic here, I, I think you can, you can appreciate. Um, alder height growth slows down fairly early. That by the time these trees are 15 years old, their height growth is half of what it was when they were five years old, and, and it's continuing to, to decline. Uh, the live crown ratio in that natural 15-year-old alder stand is down to 30% or so. Um, and so when you thin it, what you're trying to do is provide the opportunity to grow 
the crown, that factory, back big again, but with a relatively low height growth potential left in those trees, it takes them a long, long time to grow a big crown back again. And so the thinning response is very, very slow. Um, it's, it's much better to maintain that live crown than to try to rebuild it. Okay, and we did have a, um, one of our foresters chime in on the cost question, and then, and the response was that uh, it's slightly more expensive because the planting costs are higher because they're bigger trees uh, okay. for, for the planters, uh, and you're planting to a higher density than you would Douglas fir. So, okay, uh, that makes sense. But uh, but in general, it's it's relatively similar. Okay. Um, we have a Remember, question. Remember, you're, you're not going to have the same release costs down the road, so um, that's, some, that's a savings. Okay. Uh, we have a question that says, can you discuss the effect of very hot and dry summers on first-year seedlings? Hmm. I'm trying to think of some experience that would let me reflect on that. Um, I guess I, I'm not sure what to say. Um, the, the alder clearly is is more sensitive to drought conditions than than any of the other species that you're going to be working with, other than maybe hemlock, I suppose. Um, but boy, you know, if you get that in the ground with good conditions. Um, by the time the summer heat hits and and the uh, uh, you know the soils are drying out, it has roots down and out a couple of feet already. It it is an incredible grower. It's already put on three feet of height, um, and root distribution is is pretty darn good. So uh, yes, it's more sensitive to drought, but it also is very good at building that buffer in by getting that root system way out there. What alder does do as drought becomes a problem is start shedding the older leaves. That's just a self-preservation mechanism. And you can see that in many natural alder stands late summer. You'll see green leaves starting to drop out of the lower crown. That's drought. Okay, we have a question that says, do the financials prove better than planting short rotation Douglas fir, say 30 to 35 year old Doug fir plantations? Our playing um, winds up suggesting that they're, all, they're in the same ballpark. Um, and I, I, I get really worried when we start talking about economics of rotations because every landowner has slightly different costs, slightly different returns, slightly different interest rates that they're applying to things. Um, so it, it, it's the kind of analysis that in the long run folks are going to want to make individually for your property and your situation. Um, but as we have played with this and looked at the effects of costs of, you know, lumber, uh, log, log prices and, and uh, establishment costs and so on, they're, they're clearly in the same ballpark. Some, some analyses show the, the alder coming out ahead and some show the Douglas fir coming out ahead. Okay, and then we have a question that says if we, if we plant alder and manage it to rotation, do we want to follow it with an alder rotation or a rotation of Douglas fir? Good question and I should have covered something related to that early on. Um, there was some uh, work out of the University of Washington early on in, in the alder history here where um, there were concerns raised about the effect of alder being planted after alder um, and because they had a site where putting alder after alder um, did very poorly. They kind of split an alder stand in half and Half of it wound up with alder on it, and half wound up with Douglas fir on it. Douglas fir did fine, and the alder did rather poorly. Um, it's hard to know what was going on in that situation. Um, it was a uh, glacial outwash, pretty coarse soils. Um, it was a, a salal understory, and we have learned that salal is an indicator of a very bad place for red alder. 
Um, so what was going on there, I don't know. We have planted alder in many, many places now, sometimes alder after alder, sometimes alder after Douglas fir, and we have never had a problem. So um, I'm not saying it can't happen, but I sure haven't seen it beyond that one example on a glacial outwash with Salal understory. There's another half of an answer to this question, and that is that red alder is a nitrogen fixer. And so it is uh, adding nitrogen to the soils on these sites. Um, it fixes on the order of 100 to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, and that all winds up added back into the soil um, in root turnover and leaf fall and so on. The leaves that it drops in the fall are 2% nitrogen. It's amazing, incredibly wasteful trees. Um, so there may be some huge advantages, particularly on these glaciated soils that are already pouring in, to Douglas fir following alder. That Douglas fir may grow much better than you would have expected if that alder had not been there, simply because the soil nitrogen level is so much higher than it was before. Okay. Down to some of the Oregon Coast Range sites where you already have high soil land, that benefit's not going to be seen. Okay, and we have one last question, and it says, um, has there been any recent follow-up of Lyle Almond's work on planting red alder with Sitka spruce to reduce uh, white pine weevil damage? I haven't run into Lyle in a long time, so I don't know how that work came out. I know I have also seen up in BC a similar study where they put spruce under alder. Um, I, I, my forestry background was in New England where we had the same weevil getting into the eastern white pine and there we, we talked about growing that pine under a hardwood canopy and people were also exploring that. Um, you know, theoretically it should help. Um, but you're talking about growing spruce beyond the fog belt and whether that is something desirable to do is is a question I don't understand. I mean, I, beyond the fog belt, you say, you know, why not Douglas fir, where you don't have that, that issue? I would think the market for Doug fir is better than spruce most places, so. Um, okay. okay, we did have another. Um, I'm rambling. Uh, we had one, one more uh, question here that's a, that's a follow-up, I think, to the study that you did where you had mixed Douglas fir and alder. Yes. So, so does the question, it's a question, make sense to plant mixed uh, fir alder, commercial harvest the alder, and save the fir for a commercial fir harvest later? Question mark? Managing alder and Douglas fir together is really tricky, and I generally don't recommend it. And, and the problem is that the alder tops out in height growth relatively early, um, and the Douglas fir keeps on going. It's one of the real strengths of Douglas fir. Um, but it means that by the time this stand is 30 years old, that alder is in the bottom of a Douglas fir well, and it's not growing very well, very well at all. Um, and so you're coming in and doing a commercial thinning, I guess, at that time where you're taking out the alder and some of the Douglas fir. I, I think that by and large people are going to be a dollars ahead if they manage um, pure patches of species, if not pure plantations of species, and if you want to get the benefits of, of, of the mixes, meaning the benefits of the nitrogen fixation, um, I would alternate rotations uh, rather than um, uh, mix within a particular plantation. We're doing this study of mixes because sometimes you wind up with those mixes anyway, and you have questions that, you know, I've got four alder trees here and they're surrounded by Douglas fir, what should I do? And, and I'm, we're hoping that we can provide some guidance in, in that setting. 